A very good evening to all of you. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm the founding vice chancellor of OP Jindal Global University. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to this eminent educators colloquium on the theme agenda setting for leadership on the webinar theme, the future of education, collaboration and team building. I would like to recognize the presence of my partner and collaborator, Mr. Dilip Tharkur, who is also heading uh, the magazine Education World, and I will be introducing him and other distinguished panelists very shortly. Let me quickly introduce the theme of this evening's colloquium. Collaboration is considered as one of the most important 21st century skills. Critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication have been talked about as the four C's of the 21st century skills. Collaboration is absolutely essential for team building in order to do any kind of productive work in the workplace. However, we know that schools operate within a competitive mainstream system of education globally. The school curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment modules are all designed to provide students with competitive edge over each other to secure the coveted admission in higher education institutions for pursuing their careers. Moreover, the education institutions operate within a competitive ecosystem. Several projects are launched by top administrators to bring significant change in the way schools operate. However, if we start measuring the average success rate of school level improvement projects, we still find the number to be abysmal. The reason is not that the teachers and school administrators are not sincere in their efforts. Often the reason is that they are not able to work effectively as a team to drive change. This ability to work as a team and collaborate to achieve common goals and aspirations does not come naturally and it needs to be cultivated consciously. Unfortunately, our school, and I also say our university education system, does not place much emphasis on this aspect. Oftentimes, students graduate without seriously working on a single group project. If schools can work to develop these capacities among students and teachers, the students' learning outcomes, as well as teacher motivation and school climate would significantly improve. Can the existing situation be changed? Can the school, can the schools train their faculty and staff to collaborate effectively as a team? Can teachers training programs incorporate the most critical research on teams and team building and teamwork and collaboration to drive change within the classroom pedagogies and institutional culture within schools? What can schools do inside and outside the classrooms to inculcate in students the spirit of teamwork and collaboration? These will become some of the issues that we will discuss in, these, in this week's colloquium focused on collaboration and team building. I am delighted to welcome an outstanding group of institution builders who have joined me this evening. Dr. Craig Cook is the principal of Woodstock School, Missouri. He has a wealth of experience in education leadership, having worked at schools and in higher education in, uh, institutions in the United States, the Philippines, and Indonesia. He has a PhD in sociology, from Atindo Manila University in the Philippines, a BA degree in intercultural studies and an MDiv in theology, both from the Biola University, California. He currently serves as president of the International Sociological Association's Research Committee on Sociology of the Body. He started his teaching career as a high school teacher in La Habra in California. Thank you, Dr. Krupp, for, for being here. Great to be here. We have with us Ms. Sunita George, who is the principal of Bombay Scottish School in Mumbai. Ms. George is the postgraduate in school administration, a certified trainer for digital citizenship and a master trainer for adolescence education program with 25 years of experience in teaching and administration. Through her initiative, Digital Safety for, for which are in a, through her initiative for digital safety, she has been working towards empowering the youth to think critically and behave safely in the digital world. She has been felicitated with a social action award by the Indian Development Foundation in 2015 for effectively engaging the students in community service programs. She was also awarded the Vocational Excellence Award in the year 2017. Thank you very much, Ms. George, for joining us this evening. We have with us Ms. Nishi Mishra, who is the principal of Sindhya Kanya Vidyalaya in Gwalior and is also the chairperson of the prestigious Indian Public Schools Conference. She received the CBSC National Award for Principals in 2019. Ms. Mishra's quest for experiential learning and teaching creativity has been evident throughout her professional experience encompassing 28 years in schools such as Sherwood College, Nainital, and Vidya Devi Jindal School, Hisar, to name a few. She initiated a project SKV Sankar in school to manufacture low-cost sanitary napkins for underprivileged women in a village 
that has been adopted by the school. She encouraged her students to develop an end-to-end -end business plan to set up another unit in the village itself. Thank you, Ms. Mishra, for joining us this evening. We have with us Ms. Shalini Merotra, who is the principal of Vidya Devi Jindal School, Hisar. Ms. Shalini Merotra has over 25 years of enriching experience in the field of education. In her professional voyage, she has had an opportunity to be associated with several schools of repute, namely the Sindhya School Gwalior, the Assam Valley School, the Mayo Gol College Girls School, Ajmer. She is an advocate of real education that lies beyond the textbooks. Thus, as the principal of Vidya Devi Jindal School, she looks at the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual development of the community by continually disrupting the status quo so as to make the staff and students come out of the comfort zone and surpass themselves with all possible institutional support for the same. She promotes the pedagogy that involves not only experiential learning strategies that foster critical thinking, but also empowers every child physically, emotionally, socially, and spiritually for their overall well-being. Thank you, Ms. Marutra, for joining us this evening. And of course, I have great pleasure in wel welcoming and introducing my collaborator and co-conspirator, Mr. Dilip Thakur, who is a publisher and editor of Education World and Parents World. Since November 99, the publisher and editor of these both these magazines, the Human Development Magazine, the Education the World is India's, perhaps Asia's first education news and analysis magazine with a national readership comprising academics, parents, and high school students. Uh, their estimated readership is about 1 million across the country. Earlier, he was founding editor of Business India and Business World, India's first two business magazines which catalyzed the economic liberalization and deregulation initiative of 1991. All right. Uh, let me move uh, to our uh, this evening's uh, conversation. My first question is to uh, Ms. Shalini Merotra. Ms. Merotra, among the primary mode of teaching in schools, uh, the lecture method dominates, the sage or the stage model. The teacher is the knower and the giver, while the student is the recipient of knowledge and instructions. For the students are discouraged to a large extent in many schools to talk to each other regarding even assignments. Such an engagement gets dubbed as cheating and possibly results in punishment. Will you agree with this analysis? But more importantly, is it reasonable to expect students to understand the true meaning of collaboration and collaborating towards a common cause under these conditions? Ms. Merotra. Thank you, uh, Professor Kumar, uh, for, a, for a really long question. Um, and uh, for the benefit of all, if I, if I divide this question and see it in parts, so I understand that it has got a statement on primary model of teaching, followed by two questions. Yeah. That do I agree with the analysis? And uh, is it reasonable to expect the students to understand collaboration uh, under such conditions that have been defined in this question? So uh, let me respond in reverse that certainly it is not reasonable to expect students to understand collaboration under the conditions that have been expressed here. Uh, and there's a reason why collaboration is not possible in the existing evaluation pattern. As we said that, uh, uh, you know, if the, if the, uh, if the children uh, would uh, discuss, uh, then it would be, it would tend to cheating or, or we call it copying because the structure and format of the systems are, are based on content testing right now. Uh, largely, I would I would not say that in all because things are changing. Uh, but for which uh, and for for content based testing, you only need sharp memory, and uh, and the skills to repeat what you have crammed. So, uh, what kind of collaboration can we possibly imagine in this scenario? Of course, uh, if if in this structure a child asks help from another child, uh, uh, it cannot be for collaboration, but simply for copying because already the content has been copied from somewhere. So for teachers to accept collaboration in assignments, I believe that the assignment structure has to be reassessed first of all. And a lot more creativity has to be infused in the modes of assessments. Different kinds of assessments have to be welcomed in schools in, in regular mode. And, uh, uh, and the assignments should be designed such that it has got uh, primarily enough scope for collaboration. Only then can we promote. So that is the fun shift that has to take place in this uh, situation or analysis that we are talking about. But having said that, I would not completely agree with the analysis of a sage on the state model that we are today talking. Yes, I would accept that uh, a lecture mode still exists as one of the most convenient ways of teaching, largely. But we also need to acknowledge that we have come a long way. 
I mean, today we cannot say that the way we were taught as kids, we are teaching kids in the same manner. Things are changing, maybe slowly, but sure the change is sustainable, I think. And we also need to accept that the alternative modes of assessments have started finding their due place in, in almost all the schools. When I'm talking about my school, from my experience, I'm very hopeful and optimistic that what is happening here is happening around the world. As you know, that CBSC has come out very clearly that the content-based teaching is getting replaced by competency-focused learning. So, so soon this will happen. Uh, you know, uh, immediately everything will change uh, because we have to shift from content to competence. Like flip classrooms, uh, role plays, surveys, uh, peer learning. These are the buzzwords in the corridors of any progressive school, according to me. Uh, and But if you ask me sincerely, at the end of all, I would say that education for me is a journey to personhood and which is to be explained by an individual, which is to be actually explored by an individual at every step. Uh, so it is not a destination where we all need to reach with perfection and that too at the same time. Uh, as we evolve, as we grow, our goal, goal post also keeps changing. So, uh, so we all are witnessing that there is a shift okay. and with COVID pandemic, uh, I mean, the latest shift that we have seen, the teaching within the four walls of the classroom have got replaced overnight with distance learning. Overnight, if I say a swift shift, this has been. The students and teachers that were vehemently opposing technology till yesterday, today it did not take them more than a week to drop their inhibitions and take a seat in front of the screen. Uh, we can no longer call them sage on the stage. They are today collaborating and discussing topics with, I would say, 25 to 30 average young minds. Um, that are no more confined to the four walls of their classrooms, but sitting in different parts of the country and also having access to innumerable learning resources at their end. And, wow. and let me tell you, at the best part is that the students, much more than ever before, have now started realizing the importance of the teacher as a collaborator and not only as an information provider. Thank you very much, Ms. Marotta, for really setting the stage for our discussion today. Um, I do appreciate the fact that a lot of innovations have indeed happened in the course of our evolution of our education system. Let me move to uh, Dr. Cook. Uh, Dr. Cook, in, you know, in the traditional model of schooling that we talked about, uh, what do you think are the points at which collaboration happened somewhat naturally without expecting the agency on the part of the teacher or even the school management to create those conditions. Do you think schools can leverage that, uh, those aspects to make some interventions that will lead to conscious collaboration and team spirit among students? And equally important is that, do the, does the different type of school boards and the kind of emphasis in those different types of school board systems, to what extent that actually shape the opportunity for creating a collaborative learning environment? Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Rajkumar. Uh, great to be with everybody this evening, and uh, thank you for the invite. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. I think historically, educational systems have really undervalued peer learning as a great form of collaboration. Right? We've usually sanctioned that as deviance. Uh, uh, I know largely in the West, where that's seen as you know you've got to work individually. And so collaboration really isn't nurtured. Yet at the same time, you have the informal networks of learning that go on in the hall rooms, in the dorms, in the uh, classrooms among students. So certainly in this particular era, we need to continue to leverage that. I think uh, with the technology or so much of education being mediated through technology, it does present a new challenge in terms of how to approach this because uh, just like, in a sense, the uh, introduction of the Walkman uh, music device 40 years ago introduced an individuated kind of music experience. Um, I think one of my favorite sociological metaphors to describe the era which, in which we live is the silent disco, where everybody is um, at a disco, but they're listening to their own music and their own earbuds and their own dan dancing to their own tune. And I think we could apply that to education, certainly where in the online format, everybody is kind of working on their own. Um, uh, you know, they can't next, be right next to someone at a desk. And so that's a challenge. What I, the language I've started to use for breaking down collaboration is in a sense, valorizing blurred lines that this technological age gives us 
in the past, again, educational institutions have been so siloed off between each other departments, faculty, students. And so that's inhibited certainly the uh, efforts and the ability to collaborate with one another. So um, my, my mantra now is bring on the blurred lines between uh, all, all of this, like we no longer can afford to be siloed off into our own uh, realms. Uh, students have more knowledge in the history of the world in their pockets through their smartphones, many of them, than, uh, than ever you know, before. And so what it calls for, I believe, is, is a change in role of the teacher as facilitator. And I like this term wayfinding that uh, we've been using a bit lately, wayfinding, put things in place for students to be able to find. And in that sense, we are able, all, able to also collaborate. But uh, this also back to our previous question goes against that kind of sage on the stage model. So I think, I think this disruption of technology, particularly in this time, is a ripe opportunity for all of us to say, let's collaborate in new ways. And that, that goes for uh, the adults in the institution with workflows. And it also goes for how students get, uh, get their learning done. So thank you. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cook, for that. Uh, let me move to Ms. Mishra. Ms. Mishra, you know, there have been studies around the world and even experiences, uh, including Professor Eric Maso from Harvard, who uses um, peer learning in classroom. It is said that, uh, uh, at least in the Indian context, Indian institutions such as IITs and IAMs have developed an institutional culture which is built on peer learning with extensive group work, both formal and informal. Now, arguably, these are high, high, higher education institutions and the pedagogical interventions are different. Now, why have we not been able to bring this pedagogical element in extensively into schools and why we are somewhat limited by the imagination of an individual unit test, midterm and end term exams, which creates uh, you know, the certain inherent challenges with regard to people appreciating the importance of uh, teamwork and often even creativity. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar. Uh, I'm very happy to be here among the uh, very distinguished panelists here. Uh, I would like to take a long run up before I jump to your question and go down to basics about what is the purpose of education? What is the purpose of learning? So to my mind, it is to make a difference. You know, we see around us so much evidence of someone's learning, which has made a difference to the way we live our lives. The light bulb, the LED screens, the optic fibers, cognitive theories of psychology, political theories, economic theories, design products. They're all the outcome of someone's learning which has made a difference to the way we live our lives. So you see the keystone for education in the 21st century or any century for that matter is creativity. Creativity is not possible without collaboration in its broadest sense. So now I come to the question you asked about peer learning and collaboration. As uh, Sir Isaac Newton famously said, <clears throat> if I have seen a little further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. He meant that without the people before him who discovered what they did, he would not have discovered anything without collaborating with their findings before him. So there is active collaboration and passive collaboration and both are powerful tools which need to be taught to students and for everyone to be aware of them so that great learning outcomes may be achieved. And you're right that the chalk and talk pedagogy was the requirement of the factory assembly line, which needed workers who would be able to do mechanical repetitive work without asking questions and without putting their minds to it. The world has changed a lot since then. Today we need minds that question and want multiple dimensions in their answers. The sage on the stage, as you called him, can no longer play the role of the repository of all knowledge and nor can the textbook be the Bible of all learning. So we need to uh, go out of our isolation and to bring in <clears throat> a conscious collaboration by designing our lesson designs in such a way <clears throat> that they are able to give us the questioning mind as well as 
em emphasize the transition that is required for peer learning with extensive group work that you are, you talked about there is no doubt about the effectiveness of peer learning as well as uh, for not only for uh, students but for teachers as well and many schools use it extensively the in an ideal world we should be having exams on demand we should be having assessments of skills as being developed by a teacher on a day to day basis but the problem lies in the format of assessments but if you look at it from the point of view of policy makers you would see that the policy is made for the last child in the last school in the last village so in today's context it would be near impossible to assess skills unless it is through a pen and paper test so your question about why are we stuck with individual unit tests and mid term and end of term exams it is because we want to standardize the examination system and without doing the mid term and the standard formal testing it is near impossible for a country like india with our kind of population and our kind of demography with our kind of rural uh, uh, heavy population in rural areas it could probably be impossible to do unless it is through these kind of examinations thank you very much ms mishra for that uh, candid response uh, we are live on facebook and youtube for all those viewers who are watching this program please feel free to send in your questions at the end of this segment of our discussion i'll be taking questions from all of you let me move to ms george ms george i do appreciate the comments that have been made by both ms marotra and uh, ms mishra and of course dr cook now you must of course have been aware of the national education policy 2020 no any people talks about a new imagination for uh, education and so uh, keeping the nep in your at the back of your mind mm -hmm. what if schools switch from individual mid term and end term exams to a mode of a more stronger continuous assessment based on collaborative project based work to evaluate uh, you know different levels of team spirit and leadership and initiative and even application of conceptual knowledge what will be the likely impact you think on student outcomes not just academic but possibly life skills what barriers do you think uh, you know are uh, do we have to make such a shift and do you think that the national education policy creates an ecosystem for that new imagination um thank you very much for having me here uh, um i think uh, you know the assessment system of any institution or uh, the system followed by the country at large actually gives you a complete picture of how students learn how uh, teachers interact uh, what is considered relevant what is the institutional culture culture so i think assessments play a very very uh, influential role uh, you know in um, reforming the entire teaching learning process so you spoke about the term end exams or uh you know the mid term exams or those uh, pen and paper tests which happen at the end of the year and which very much decide the uh, so to say the future of uh, or, or what the learning uh, has been uh if, but if you look at the most of the high stake exams currently uh, in the country have this element but they do have a certain uh, element of internal assessment the weightage is very minimal which is 20 to 30% right now but uh, in it's increasing and if you look at the nep also and the kind of uh, uh, you know vision that it has it's definitely we're looking at focusing more on skill sets um you know um increasingly i think it lays emphasis on the diversity um, of learners and the need to assess them through different techniques whether it's oral practical projects um, um, you know uh, assignments not just a pen and paper test so uh, definitely uh, you know there is uh, so to say uh, it is going to be uh, eventually things are changing uh, the change is slow it's gradual uh, but yes there is definitely a change so there is and if you look at in 2009 cbse had uh, introduced the continuous comprehensive evaluation system so it's not something which is 
absolutely new as i see it and i was in uh, working in a cbse school at that point of time and i was also very uh, closely involved with uh, training uh, programs and uh, uh, related to uh, continuous comprehensive evaluation so uh, it is definitely possible to move from that system and to some extent that movement is happening but if you look at schools today uh, we are also looking i mean by the time a child reaches grade 9 uh, we start thinking about where the child is going to be and what Oh, the future placement is what we have in our mind as parents, and that's what schools also try to kind of cater to what uh, the parents expect from the school. So, um, if you look at today, um, the uh, the entire admission process, especially with public-private partnerships with institutions like yours, uh, you know, it is changing. You know, your entire uh, admission process is changing. So, because that is changing, I think. Uh, increasingly at least in the um, urban schools there's a more awareness about uh, you know not just the term and exam but also preparing the child holistically you know uh, so uh, yes definitely it is changing and uh, your second question was about uh, you know what impact it has definitely uh, if you are looking at a comprehensive evaluation the impact Uh, is very um, the uh, the learning is enhanced because there is increased uh, involvement in, of the student. There is increased uh, teacher uh, student interaction. There is high motivation. There's a non threatening environment because when we're talking about this kind of assessment, we uh, assess them through the year. It's not one exam where uh, you know. So for example, if I look at my own school, we we have a class size of forty to forty two. So when we introduce a system like that, we need to be very well planned. So um, you know the way we um, do it is that uh, there is a. typical structure that is given to the teacher a lot of hand holding is done uh, to ensure that uh, there's a checklist provided uh, the activities and a lot of times uh, to ensure that the the environment is conducive we don't even inform the student or the parent they're not aware that this particular activity is going to be assessed so i think um, you know there is definitely a, a change happening there is definitely a shift happening um the uh, biggest challenge your third question was what's the biggest challenge that uh, we see in this kind of a system if you see the um uh, when i ask if you ask a teacher or an administrator they will immediately say time constraint however i see this more of a mindset problem because uh, somewhere we've been giving more emphasis to the content than the process teaching more than the learning uh, performing activities more than what's the learning outcome so um implementation of a comprehensive evaluation requires a detailed planning another challenge that i see uh, uh with the large numbers that we have uh and the cultural diversity of that or the cultural backgrounds that we come from as teachers is the biases that we may have or the preconceived notions that we may have about a student about a system so give me an let me give you an example you spoke about assessing leadership skills or leadership qualities but if a teachers idea of what a leader leader is itself is narrow or you know so Achoo. teacher will not be able to do justice to uh, the assessment so i think a lot a lot of it also the uh, you know the way out is training uh, right kind of training aligning the teachers to the vision of uh, you know the larger vision or the big picture um technology can come handy here uh, you know because when i remember when we were doing uh the cc uh, in schools and we were talking to and we were also i was also involved in training some of the teachers at that point of time on implementation of cc and uh, for the for many teachers you need to give them a little uh, you know uh, complete because they want everything defined so you may have to define sit together and design a structure on how it works and how it doesn't so um you have to kind of um, teacher training is i think very important sure. there that that will help us to kind of deal with the challenges because definitely these are the challenges and also the number we talking about not just urban schools in the urban areas but also in the rural uh, side that, thank you very much ms george we will come back to that part yeah. of the role of the teacher in thank this you. conversation because that i have a separate set of questions which i want to address because in some ways the teachers play a very critical role in our effort to build that collaborative learning dilip now over to you Dilip, from where you stand in the world of professions, where 
collaboration is almost destiny in the sense that you know team building and people working together if you simply don't you don't achieve the results so to what extent among the professionals particularly the young people who come into workforce do you see uh, their own ability to work together as team for example you have today hr departments in companies and corporations which are actually doing courses on team building they are creating you know a conflict resolution mechanisms they are creating a whole range of training programs and capacity building programs which are focused on team building as if it's a, a eureka moment so my question to you is that what can schools do uh, on something as foundational as collaborative uh, you know team uh, working together in and team building efforts early on yeah i'm very glad you chose this as a subject of collaboration and team building you know it's been my experience really that indians are uh, very bad at collaboration and team building they are brilliant individuals but when they have to work in teams and these days you know when you have uh, the, when you want the economies of scale when you have to, you have to have team building so i think that's in fact the achilles uh, achilles heel of our indian society really that uh, we are hopeless in working in teams uh, and uh, one way perhaps uh, one reason for that is perhaps because of the huge cultural diversity we have in our country you know most of the people who work well in teams like the japanese chinese and uh, even the europeans uh, is that they are uh, they are homogenous societies uh, they are not so sort of culturally diverse so they are able to work easily with each other in india i find that even in companies i was in business journalism for many years there are a lot of antagonism which people bring to the workplace with them and prejudices so which makes teamwork virtually uh, you know very difficult and that's why as you rightly said hr divisions uh, have to actually teach team building and collaboration which should come naturally which should come naturally and so this is very important for schools also in my opinion the schools must consciously teach Uh, the virtue of collaboration. Obviously, many hands make light work, you know. Uh, but uh, I don't think people understand this. There's a lot of individual. There's too much individualism, I think, in Indian education. And uh, there's the theme that you've chosen is uh, excellent because you have to have good teams. When I was in a uh, business world, I wrote the first cover story in Honda Motors, and I visited their factory in Japan. I was like amazed at the teamwork. you know it's a assembly line which starts and they, everybody down the line knows that he has an obligation to the person upstream that or the person upstream has an obligation to the person downstream the assembly line must never stop and that kind of collaboration i've not seen in indian industry like uh, nobody everybody makes sure that there's a steady flow of work to the next guy and that uh, that team building and collaboration has to come out of the qualities of empathy and uh, and consideration for the person next working with you and even in our own field in journalism we find that it's very difficult to get people to do team work everyone wants to do his own thing and they don't see the corporate or the larger interest organizational interest is uh, is given the back seat to the personal interest so i think it's very important for schools to consciously teach uh, collaboration team building which you can also do to do through games and i think one of the very important things that i learned i went to boarding school in india and is that games games actually uh, field games in particular hockey cricket football it's very important for everyone to play field games it's not enough to play badminton tennis boxing these are not team sports so it's very important that or in in my school in bishopatnam where i was a boarder field games were compulsory and i learned a lot uh, about collaboration and teamwork because you can't win games unless you collaborate and you uh, know thank you uh, thank you very much dilip for uh, bringing a real life example to that conversation let me move to miss uh, merotra uh, miss merotra let one the one of the critical aspects of the school ecosystem is the dominant role quite rightly so of the teachers now teachers form the backbone of any school but they are usually overburdened with teaching and administrative work among all their workload is there sufficient space left for meaningful collaboration among teachers on curricular or pedagogical innovations or 
the performance appraisal system of assessing the contribution of teachers themselves to what extent that actually influences and impacts the inability of teachers to themselves collaborate with regard to their work. What have been some of your best experiences with respect to teachers collaborating among themselves? So uh, I would rather say, uh, Professor Kumar, that meaningful collaboration is an answer to reduce the burden on teachers. You know? uh, when we collaborate, we naturally divide the load and multiply the outcome of anything that we are doing. And uh, with changing times, I think the schools are also realizing it. Um, and it's not only that in schools, the collaboration was lacking, as, as uh, Mr. Thakur said, that in every field, in every business, we Indians have been trained for too long to work individually. Uh, but I'm happy to say that the schools are the ones uh, where the change is now happening and happening rapidly. And, and the schools have started realizing that, the, uh, that we need to create some space for the, for the teachers as well as for the students, uh, to give them a space to take new initiatives. Uh, like, uh, I, I would always uh, share the latest that we are doing. Let me share some of the best experiences, as you said. And I will take the experiences during this pandemic. As, as we understand that a boarding school is always a very closely niche community. Uh, so we, we soon realized that during the sudden disruption in our normal lives, uh, what is the most essential for our students and for teachers is their physical and mental well-being uh, more than completing syllabus or anything else? So we uh, we, we recently collaborated uh, with the education department of the Museum of Art and Photography in Bangalore, and from them we learned two very creative techniques: art music and who we are. You know to explore ideas of wellness and psychological, and then uh, to self-respect by making use of of their museum art collection. So our students learned how to relate art and wellness, uh, how to explore the context of frame identity, and then to help direct someone to better understand themselves and then to understand the world around them. So it has been a fantastic collaboration that we did with, the, with, a, with an organization that's outside the school. Okay. Another very interesting collaborative initiative that emerged within the school uh, when we realized that the students and teachers are missing on social interaction. And discussions that used to be a part of their normal life when they were on campus. You know, so for that, uh, we created virtual corridors, uh, which is, uh, which is a, a concept where voluntarily a group of teachers would come, they would meet, they would discuss matters that were beyond the formal meetings defined by agendas. And teachers would share their creative ideas there. They may also share their concerns that they are facing nowadays, and to which others may provide them a solutions, or they may just listen to them. On right. the other hand, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, finish, finish your, yeah. sure. Can, may I? May yeah, I yeah, please, please, please. So, so this, and, and you know, similarly, in parallel, our girls, class 12, they created Blitz Club, you know, uh, where they are inviting students together and they are virtually interacting over Zoom, like we are discussing these topics, and their topics are fantastic. Every week they, re they release one edition or one session of their Blitz Club. So what I'm trying to say is that we believe knowledge is never linear. It's, we may have practiced it or not. Uh, we, we, uh, if we allow the osmosis between different disciplines, then it leads to amazing outcomes. That's a fact. Thank uh, you our geography department collaborates with the sculpture, math, with the sports, language teachers are involved in music, art, dance, drama into their classroom. And all this is leading to a great learning outcomes. Thank you very much, Ms. Marotra, for that. I think. Uh, what you have given us is a very interesting, uh, you know, role that teachers and institutions can play with regard to, you know, uh, evolving a vision for collaboration. Dr. Cook, uh, Lav and Wenger coined the term communities of practice. Uh, this refers, and I quote, to a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something that they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly, unquote. Now, usually these are not limited to a single organization. Do you see such communities of practice, as Lav and Wenger said, uh, within your school? Are you part of any such community of school leaders who work together so that this particular vision can be brought into the intellectual imagination of a school ecosystem in which teachers play a leading role in developing those communities of practice? How can we promote such aspects in our schools? 
Yeah, great question, Professor uh, Rajkumar. I think uh, it's a challenge because uh, we have theory and we have practice and some of these structures that have been in place in schools, no matter what school you're a part of, tend to persist over time. So I think the role of administration in this is to really break down those barriers. And um, so often we go by formal roles and I've always been a firm believer of leadership, whether it's formal or informal. So you've got to create space that's safe for teachers to be able to come together um, whatever you call it, whether it's professional learning community, whether it's the, uh, I was a part of one school where we instituted a learning uh, committee and all things and all people were invited to this committee on anything related to learning. But that was the discipline of that. It was only learning. Uh, issues of school uniforms and lunches were not discussed. It was really about learning. And so um, I know we're still working at that here at Woodstock of trying to create spaces for teachers to be able to talk across disciplines and across levels, because I think one of the things we'll find is we, we often, again, operating in our silos, think that we're the only ones dealing with that particular issue. And then all of a sudden we find that there are actually some universals going on here. Recently during the pandemic, what we've started to do in terms of institutions uh, is uh, all the school heads in Missouri have met and we plan to meet monthly. And what we're finding there is that um, there are a lot of universals. We are facing the very similar issues. There's other associations that I'm a part of, Academy of International School Heads, which I've found to be incredibly helpful in collaboration on, particularly in this time of pandemic, of how we're adjusting, how we're shifting the way of learning. So um, I think the role of the administration there is to really create more egalitarian structures where everybody is talking about learning in the institution. And in fact, my, um, one of my own performance assessment domains, uh, one of six is really in this very thing. Do you promote learning? And one of those ways is to make sure that teachers are talking to each other across disciplines and across schools within your school. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Uh, let me move to Ms. Uh... Mishra, Ms. Mishra, you know, teachers usually uh, join in, in a school uh, as people who have just taken their you know, early career jobs or with experience from other schools. Now, in the latter case, there's a possibility of the new teacher bringing strong cultural practices, institutional experiences from previous school. This could have implications for organizational learning and has been well recognized, at least in the context of business organization research, as well as a good practice. Now, do you have, uh, let's say, processes to allow teachers learn from the experiences and practices of uh, people who come from other experiences? Has that even uh, resulted in new practices emerging within your school context? And I ask this because, you know, you're obviously, uh, you know, leading a very old and reputed and, uh, uh, you know, historically evolved school. And there is always the challenge of institutions which are, older. I mean, having studied at Oxford, which is 800 years old, I remember my one of my deans at Oxford said that uh, if we were to decide something today, that something new should happen, it will typically take three to five years for a decision to be made. So I wanted to ask you, how has been your experience? I agree that uh... Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. So I, I do agree that the traditional school model is definitely one that follows the uh, autocratic leadership model with, in which all knowledge flows top down. It not only prevents uh, creativity, but it also mars initiative. So what has worked for some schools like mine is to apply the flipped classroom model to teacher meetings. So we routinely have uh, presentations uh, being done by the faculty for the rest of the faculty. So a democratic approach to getting answers always uh, reaps uh, rich dividends. The brainstorming methods uh, for arri arriving at uh, solutions. And uh, this also works uh, very well uh, when you have uh, a, a common problem, but uh, no solution in mind. And it is wonderful when a chaotic rush of ideas 
slowly start to fall in some kind of order and the element of creativity starts uh, transposing the uh, old ideas onto new and uh, the fusing of these completely disparate uh, ideas arrive at a brand new solution uh, for seemingly impossible solutions so uh, the teacher motivation and the mid level training are uh, things which really need to be worked on to get uh, to this point and the best practices in teacher collaboration come from peer observation the teacher as a learner approach which leads to transdisciplinary approaches opening up for lesson designs sitting in on each other's classes by invitation and uh, serving as a co-teacher in another teacher's class puts a lot of uh, things in perspective for the observer teacher just as much learning takes place with regard to learning what to do for a successful lesson one gets inputs on what not to do for a successful lesson but here the art of giving feedback to the teacher being observed is also very critical uh, listening empathetically is another key element in peer learning and learning from new teachers coming in fresh with new ideas from different places the uh, mantra should be let no idea slip through no matter how outlandish it might sound in fact i believe that the more ridiculous the idea the better the disruption that it will cause so if a culture of openness of listening of being comfortable with a colleague sitting in on your class can be developed that would be the beginning of a major change and innovation in the pedagogy as well as growth of students thank you very much ms mishra for those really inspiring set of reflections and comments uh, let me move to ms george ms george we of course are aware that effective teamwork and collaboration requires that the members of the team have a voice and uh, people feel free to express their concerns or even share their ideas uh, it is also equally important that any form of democratic engagement and institutional conversation is also based upon some form of hierarchy that is obviously present in schools colleges universities no doubt teachers usually uh, take uh, their direction from the management including principals or heads of subjects or grade leaders and that's part of an organizational culture now does that culture uh, and the structure present a challenge in schools in general and how can we break these barriers to ensure that effective teamwork actually contributes to innovation and long lasting let's say changes that will in many ways fulfill the larger goals and aspirations of an institution how do you build that imagination within a school miss george Uh, so, if you look at the uh, most school culture, not just I, of course I come from a school which is more than 175 year old. Uh, so this culture is uh, way more deep rooted. But if you look at most schools, the uh, uh, we somewhere have uh, you know the the traditional setup is where teachers are expected to work like worker bees, you know, consuming more than creating, following instructions. Uh, even the idea or an image of a administrator is somebody who's strong and who gives in instructions. and everybody follows this uh, so i think uh, this definitely i mean this is a challenge because when i remember working in an organization um, before this where uh, i had once uh, my coordinator came to me and said that you have told me this is to be done but you're not telling me how to do it i said because i will not tell you how to do it i want you to try different things and see what works so um, you know th that definitely uh, there is an expectation from uh, the image of a school uh, administrator whether it's a coordinator or a teacher or, or a principal is very um, you know uh, somebody who knows everything and is going to give you everything correct and you know somewhere is up there so i think that definitely is a challenge for most schools in the country having said that if you're talking about collaboration the first step always is communication and building trust and relationships so i think uh, the way i look at it and i and i worked with multiple schools as principal and uh, i you know kind of uh, have worked with traditional schools and uh, also different kinds of schools and i see that uh, the first step is being accessible and sharing your vision uh, about 
the organization, taking their buy-in in designing the vision. So I remember when I joined Bombay Scottish uh, School, I remember the first uh, exercise that we did was uh, where we uh, had the teachers participate in a kind of a role play where they had to depict what the school should, where should the school be or where do they school, see the school five years from then. And based on that, we kind of discussed and designed that this is what we want to do and this is where we want to see the school. So even taking their buy-in in designing uh, the vision for the school. So I think that uh, definitely being accessible, taking, uh, you know, that that's uh, one of the ways of, um, you know, cutting down those barriers or uh, facing those challenges, which a traditional setup uh, poses. Another thing is uh, I have always maintained that, uh, um, uh, you know, when you look at uh, um, uh, uh, most of the professions, you have a league of people, you have a team of people, so you have a league of barristers, you'll have everywhere when you look at these, uh, whereas a teacher is always alone, we've somewhere kind of given that solo, uh, so encouraging them to have collaborative lessons where you have across discipline teachers uh, going to the class and conducting sessions, I think that uh, particularly is helpful. Uh, we have all, I have also find found technology to be a big enabler in this particular case because what happens is when we have new teachers coming on board most of them are very comfortable with technology and I have this experienced teachers who are like extremely uh, bring in that kind of uh, expertise uh, so when you make a buddy system where you have uh, you know the uh, so there is a definitely an exchange of ideas and uh, you know so that uh, uh, definitely in fact if you ask me in particular pandemic and the lockdown situation uh, we had uh, you know three to four days to kind of decide the platform and go on board and and the amount of uh, uh, skill sets that we saw the the number of teachers that we saw uh, who came forward and who took the initiative uh, to train others so there's a lot of peer learning which happens so uh, that I think has really, really helped and, and providing a non-threatening environment, allowing people to fail, I think, experiment and fail. That I feel is most, most important, uh, you know, to break this barrier of uh, the traditional setup where, you know, you can't voice your concern and also, ha you know, uh, ha allowing the teachers to express themselves at the same time, uh, you know, it's, but having said that, this is very easy to say, but it sometimes does require more time, investment of time. So when you're talking about uh, staff meetings, our meetings go very long because a lot of ideas, we're still deliberating, we're discussing, uh, and then we come back to. So it, it is time consuming process, but it's all worth it because, uh, you know, uh, it brings out a lot of new things and a lot of uh, new ideas and Thank you, Ms. George, for that. Uh, Dilip, so, you know, you heard, uh, you heard the principals and the leaders talking about the school experiences. Now, you know that businesses, especially the listed companies that have proper HR departments and strategy departments and training and development processes, they look at the latest research to shape their strategies. That's definitely true for marketing, which focused on, let's say, behavioral economics or neuroscience to, to sell more or operations and supply chain management to make process more efficient. Now compare this to our schools. Now, uh, the fact is institutional research about how schools function and that knowledge and practices being made available for schools to work on empirical analysis of what works and what doesn't is uh, you know, far limited. So my question to you is that, what can schools learn from, let's say, organizations and business enterprises in the form of practices that can be adopted, keeping in mind that they are in different institutional creations with probably different objectives. Yeah, well, I think uh, one of the most important things, uh, well, just to start off, I'm a great believer in academia and industry collaboration. You know, There are some countries in Europe, and even in Singapore, uh, where uh, where industry gets involved even in the framing of school curriculums, uh, especially in Netherlands and uh, countries like that, at the local stage, right from uh, primary school stage, the leaders of industry in that particular area where the school is located are involved with the school. I, in India, like I think they exist on different planets. Industry is on a different planet, and uh, 
education, including higher education, seem to be on different planets. I think that's one great weakness of Indian education. But I think uh, there's a lot they can learn from each other. And I think from uh, schools can learn a lot about goal setting, uh, target, uh, meeting targets, uh, and uh, collaboration, uh, cooperation, etc. How important it is because uh, no organization, I mean, it's, uh, it's self-evident, no organization, organization can succeed in the marketplace unless they, it's a, they have some internal co cooperation. And the same thing has to happen in schools. And I've, unfortunately, I find that there's not sufficient emphasis in education on team building, on collaboration, which is the theme of your conference, a very important thing. I think, uh, unfortunately, Indians, as I said, are brilliant individuals, but hopeless team players. And you have only to look at, for example, in parliament, you know, I mean, even uh, in things that are patently in the national interests people are finding huge differences. What was uh, the, uh, this farmer's policy was advocated by the Congress. By the way, it was advocated by us years ago in, in, um, in the business magazines. But uh, what, what was advocated by the Congress uh, only a few years ago is now being opposed by it. This is not the way to build countries. It's not the way to build com uh, companies. It's not the way to build organizations. I think there has to be a certain uh, uh, sacrifice of self-interest in the, in the interests of the organization interests. And this has to be actively taught in schools and education institutions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dilip. Uh, I, I appreciate your comments. Let me move to Ms. Merotra. Ms. Merotra, our schools are defined by their rivalries, especially private schools. The more you go towards the top, the stronger are the rivals. And that's not limited by school. Even in colleges and universities, that happens. Now, inter-school rivalry is the major theme and not necessarily inter-school collaboration. Uh, now, of course, that could be an exaggeration, but I would love to have your views on it. Can schools gain anything by collaborating with each other? Is such a thought uh, impracticable, impractical to implement? Uh, can you reflect on it? Uh, certainly, uh, Professor Kumar, I think collaborating with each other is definitely not an impractical thought. Uh, it just requires, a, I believe, long-term vision. You know, as it, as it is natural that we all human beings have a lot to learn from each other. Um, and as we keep meeting with, on various forums, like one we are interacting today, we do imbibe a lot of best practices naturally without knowing it. That how much we are going to learn this evening, uh, we, have, we will take some time to reflect on. So uh, talking uh, about more structured collaboration where it's happening, uh, I would not say that schools uh, are, are, you know, on rivalry. Uh, of course, there can be some competition, like within the school, we have inter-school, com inter-house competitions and other. So that kind of competition can be healthy. But I would say that the schools, and when I say about our school, I say for all the schools, I'm very, I'm very optimistic about that. Uh, like if I talk like a member school of Round Square, member school of IPSC, NPSC, Generation Global, there are so many such common forums uh, from where for years our students, teachers, and principals, including all have been collaborating and learning in different capacities. You know, then uh, another way that we are collaborating, uh, uh, we have student and uh, teachers exchanges, which is a little longer interaction uh, than meeting during conferences. And I would say that is also a great way to collaborate. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, I, I, would, um, I would mention here that Hubs of Learning, which is a wonderful initiative by the CBSC for the affiliated schools to share, cooperate, and learn from each other. So under this program, what they're doing is that, uh, uh, and we are, BBJS is a lead collaborator school uh, with five other schools in the city. And here they believe that uh, uh, we have much to learn from a small school with less resources as from a large school with several uh, resources, you know. Another wonderful practice that I have seen recently, and I have been a part of it, I have traveled uh, under that program, is prevalent nowadays is that unconventional and creative schools, you know, which we call that those who do not go by the norm. They, the, you, that those who follow unique practices and pedagogy, uh, they have opened up their doors for the schools to visit them and learn from their practices and take away what you can take away for your school. 
Uh, I have like visited several such schools that are doing fantastic work in the field of education. And from those learnings, uh, uh, we have come back and we have revamped our strategies for better learning outcomes. Uh, like I can share, there's a, there's a school in Ahmedabad where I traveled and, and I learned their uh, teaching pedagogy. I, and then we brought them back to our school. We trained our teachers to learn that way. And then we, we just changed our entire teaching pedagogy, learning from that particular school. So I think collective intelligence works with absolute brilliance. Thank and you very much, Ms. Barotha. That was a very optimistic outlook of what <laughs> schools can potentially do. And I appreciate the fact that despite the fact that there's a natural uh, tendency to compete in a particular space, uh, the possibility to learn from each other, particularly when it comes to institutional experiences, is going to be valuable. Uh, let me move to Dr. Cook. Dr. Cook, now COVID-19 has normalized remote interactions. We are all collaborating and working together via Zoom and MS Teams or Google Meet and other such platforms. Now, does this development create possibilities for even cross-border distance collaboration between schools for international and intercultural education? Maybe that didn't exist a few months ago. Do you think that the school management and teachers will now be more open for such cross-institutional collaboration? And of course, uh, it'll be useful for you to reflect on whether and to what extent this will benefit the student learning uh, in numerous ways. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it will be a missed opportunity for us all in education if we don't use this rupture to uh, learn to collaborate across institutions, across disciplines. And again, some of my favorite models in education, even with the global pandemic, are the schools that have created classes around the global pandemic from an interdisciplinary perspective. And uh, I think the strain that's uh, being introduced in the market, in a sense, with uh, in, in, in our world of the board, boarding school, where um, parents are a little reticent to send their kids away to school during a pandemic, we've got to find ways to work together, uh, whether that's uh, sh sharing resources of faculty, of information. And again, as referenced earlier, um, the rupture has produced, in a sense, a reaching across aisles, reaching across institutions to collaborate. Um, it's so easy to get stuck in our own world. And I think we need to develop, again, spaces that allow for cross-institutional, cross-disciplinary work at Woodstock, we have a Center for Imagination, which its intent when it's in its genesis was to um, help our students look outward. So we have a community engagement um, director and office that helps us to focus on things outside of our school campus. And so uh, we've still got a long ways to go in that, but that's uh, we're on that journey. And certainly this, this rupture is, is making the time right. Um, I think the biggest uh, danger I see to that is um, the rationalization of the education system using Max Weber's term of calculated rationality and modernity. And he was afraid in modernity that we would lose the enchantment. And I see that in education, both in our government and accreditation constraints that require certain standards constantly, which are good. There's nothing wrong with standards, but uh, it, it creates a, in a sense, a treadmill of uh, rationality. And so some of the magic is lost in education. So I think on also on top of that, moving everything online, which so many of us have had to do, really is another form of that rationalization. You can't walk into a classroom and be the shaman and the magician in a sense, and uh, the hero. Um, you've got to uh, articulate those outcomes ahead of time. And so it's, it's, uh, it's it, and you know, teachers are all working very hard. And so how do you um, get the magic back? And I think part of that is collaboration. Uh, some of all of us, I guarantee you, if we ask it, on this panel, what are your most incredible learning teaching moments? It's usually when we're in the classroom with a fellow colleague uh, talking about the same topic from a different perspective. So I, I think that's where we need to go. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cook, for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me move to uh, Ms. Mishra. Uh, Ms. Mishra, you know, if schools were to play a larger role in society than simply teaching content to students, they obviously need to overall their process and structures. Now, arguably, the National Education Policy 2020 has provided an opportunity for promoting experiential learning. What happens inside classrooms 
uh, to score marks need to be, uh, let's say, supplemented with other things that happen beyond. So my question to you is that what kind of changes do, let's say, policymakers, but more importantly, education administrators and even teachers need to make both in the curriculum and the pedagogy of learning that will facilitate this transition? So you're right that the role of uh, collaboration and coordination is central to the problem uh, solving and uh, bringing about change in the classroom, in the school and the school community systems. Uh, collaboration and coordination are uh, extremely essential to change in relationships among people, which leads to change in practices, which ultimately leads to healthy development and academic progress in students. But achieving these goals for each student requires collaboration among professionals within the school, as well as outside the school in the community. This challenge raises several questions. How do professionals from different disciplines work together and blend their skills and talents to address the developmental needs of students? How do professionals work across institutional boundaries of schools and community agencies? So what are the attitudes and the beliefs and uh, the collaboration that are needed to work together effectively? So often both the success and the difficulties of the collaborative processes can be traced to problems in professional and personal relationships. Likewise, the cornerstones of uh, coordinated interagency relationships are the interpersonal relationships and individuals involved. So the quality of these relationships depends on the team skills and beliefs and attitudes of the people involved. And uh, the importance of the community in, uh, in shaping the education of the students, that needs to be looked at very, very carefully. If the district administration and different individuals in the administration are given a jurisdiction where each of them gets to visit, let's say, five schools during the space of a whole year. That is not saying very much. Then we manage to bring the outside world to the school because it's not always possible to take the school outside to the world. There are constraints of funds. There are constraints of safety protocols. So what needs to change is the way in which we assess the students because ultimately everybody, whether you like it or not, we are teaching to the test. So unless that changes, nothing really will change. Yeah. And teaching to the test, I have to say this, but higher education institutions also have to play a role because they take the students according to the marks. So unless something changes there, you cannot hope for it change at the grassroots level. Thank you very much, Ms. Mishra. And I do believe that that's a larger challenge that we need to address. And uh, of course, at OP Jindal Global University, we have consistently maintained that we need to have a holistic approach towards assessment and performance. And uh, my heart goes out to those students who are consistently aiming to get into some of those colleges whose names I will not mention, in which uh, even if you have secured 95 percentage in your 12 standard marks, you are almost made to feel that you have made um, a big blunder in your life. So we need to reimagine uh, your entire educational system in the, to address that. Let me move to Ms. George. Uh, now, before I uh, invite Ms. George, we are, of course, coming to the end of this segment. For all those uh, viewers in uh, watching us live on Facebook and YouTube, uh, I have already received some questions and feel free to send in your questions. And very shortly, I'll be taking those questions directly with our very distinguished panelists. Ms. George, our world, as you know, is dominated by complex problems that at times have no solution or at least no simple solution. In policy circles, these are termed as wicked problems. Schools are, of course, present in every nook and corner of the country. Now, can there be a possibility of that these institutions collaborating with each other and possibly with local governments and civil society organizations work on not necessarily addressing the problem fundamentally, but even creating a greater sense of awareness of the complexity of the real world problems that the country is facing. Now, I say this because of the fact that many a time 
schools and school education tend to be somewhat let's say secluded from social realities and even uh, the more affluent the communities in which the schools function there is a greater degree of let's say uh, you know uh, indifference in that functioning so to what extent the vision of experiential learning could be translated into the lived experiences of students ms george uh, so if you look at uh, the community work programs which are currently uh, you know schools are undertaking um there are uh, these kind of projects which are taken collaboratively uh, you know for example a lot of beach cleanup activities which are happening currently uh, where schools uh, students from different schools are collaborating together uh, i think social media is also being a big uh, uh, kind of a boon here because that, that's helping the students to connect across schools so definitely uh, you know there is uh, of course there's a lack of a formal platform where that happens but it happens at a very uh, informal way so uh, for example um, as a school uh, we last year uh, did a uh, digital safety program where we collaborated with 21 schools to spread awareness about fake news the relevance of authenticating information before sharing um we currently as we talking we are currently uh, uh, in the process of collaborating with the school to implement a mental health program in our own school so um, you know these things are happening but there has definitely uh, there is uh, uh, there's no platform where we uh, come and say okay this is an area and we look at the entire map of the uh, place and say these other schools for example my school is in mahim so which are the other schools in mahim and how do we then look at some of create a bank of uh, the real world problems that that particular area faces and then collaborate and see uh, how do we bring in awareness or uh, engage children in you know some uh, process of design thinking where they can at least uh, if not solve the problems definitely i mean these are big problems and cannot be uh, solved easily but at least make an attempt to or try to understand the problem uh so definitely there's a lack of uh, you know that kind of uh, i think as school leaders also somewhere uh, we have to be uh, take that first step because we somewhere too absorbed within our schools our day to day administration that we rarely uh, kind of get time to come together and think about this so there uh, definitely is a need of uh, you know something like this uh, on, on a more formal uh, way uh, another thing is that when we're talking about these real or these problems uh we need to uh, uh if you look at our curriculum our curriculum also needs to be more relevant to something like this which promotes like this our children should be aware of where to report a problem whom to contact what are the challenges uh of governance uh okay. you know uh, so i think those uh, our curriculum also has to have these elements there should be some amount of exposure to you know community living and uh, you know actually living uh, whether it's uh, in and understanding hands on experience of uh, working uh, so for example uh, i remember um, you know when we uh, had taken some of our students to a, a, a village to see a hamlet uh, which was uh, which had uh, solar uh, energy solar power plants the kind of learning and the kind of questions which you know came up uh, and they actually see what's happening so uh, you know there was uh how do you sustain it how do you ensure that when uh, once it's uh, done how uh, the the discontinuity so those kind of things uh, otherwise we are most of the times when we are talking about things we're talking about it in isolation okay. uh, so i think that's where uh, you know they need to get into the space get their hands dirty uh, currently in the covid situation uh, we have students who are doing crowd funding who are doing i mean leveraging that platform uh, to do whatever they can for the society but yes i think a little more awareness uh, getting into or having a program of internship where they actually have to stay in a particular area and solve a problem thank you very much ms george uh, before i get into questions dilip quickly but to what extent do you think dilip uh, you know internship opportunities and i am very conscious of using this word because as somebody who has that spent most of uh, my own childhood uh you know the only internship i had during school was climbing trees and eating mangoes and playing all kinds of games and doing pretty much nothing uh, connected to what our kids do uh you know nowadays 
you know, it's it's actually quite normal for a students in high school to do internships. Now, to some extent, I was shocked that people are doing that. But then maybe what kind of internship imaginations could be created whereby students still, you know, end up not losing their childhood, uh, but at the same time have a peep into the way, let's say, organizations, businesses, uh, you know, institutions function. Well, I think there are immediate opportunities like that. Uh, you know, uh, for example, the long summer holidays. Uh, I think that there needs to be what we discussed earlier: the greater cooperation between academia and the industry. Um, I regret to say that actually industry uh, doesn't care uh, for very much for the academy and the other way around also. Uh, children could go on a uh, work uh, a day or two in a factory, get the uh, idea as to how, how things function. They could go and uh, visit, uh, uh, you know, uh, some uh, go around with salesmen to see uh, how difficult that job is, to get some idea, as you were saying earlier, that we need to get involved with the outward community. You know, the school should be an island unto itself, where uh, unfortunately most schools in India are like uh, fortresses and uh, people, uh, the children inside know nothing about what's happening outside. And I regret to say management's actually discourage political discussions in schools, uh, saying, oh, no, no, that will create uh, problems, uh, image problems for the school and will create uh, unrest. I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, the problems that larger society should be discussed in school debates and others. And there should be a, an encouragement both ways between industry to allow children to uh, visit factories, visit companies, and uh, get uh, get a hand uh, of what's uh, happening in the world outside. Thank you very much, uh, Dilip. Let's move now to the uh, Q&A session. I have several questions and I'll take up a few. I'm conscious of the time. Ms. Merotra, there's a question from Alphonse Nathaniel and a question that reads like this. It is true that we have entered into a new era of education virtually approaching to the students, but in Indian context, the technology needs to get advanced. Uh, how do we create, uh, how do we address the question of digital divide in the sense that you know, schools tend to be privileged. Some of them have better opportunities, but there is still a large number of schools uh, who still are not able to provide the opportunities to the students. So how do we address the digital divide question? Um, so so my, my response to it this would be that, you know, not only in schools and not only related to digital device, a divide, uh, in a community or in a society or in the world, uh, Progress will always be in stages. Everyone today cannot come to the same platform, meeting the same benchmarks, having the same goals for themselves. So as either we wait for everybody to come to the line, and then we begin the race, or we all keep taking small steps at our own levels. And wherever we are, I strongly believe that for me, progress is that what I am today, I'm better than what I was yesterday. So I think that even in, in context to the digital divide, uh, divide or, or you may take uh, uh, social cultural divides or you may take economical divides, uh, divides will always be there. We all are not going to come at par anywhere and because it's a hypothetical situation, you know, uh, and people don't evolve like that. So I think the answer is that wherever we are, we try to take a small step further uh, towards this vision of, you know, liberalizing education and, and giving the charge to the child, the learner should be the deciding factor of what the learner wants to learn, you know? And I think in that this technology and, and moving children out of the school walls have done a wonderful thing. We should thanks to COVID that this rapid change has taken place, which would have taken 10 more years, according to me, had COVID not happened. Thank you very much, Ms. Marotra, for your very candid response on that. Uh, Dr. Cook, there's a question about the education boards. Uh, are our education boards too large, too distant from realities of schools, teachers, and children? Is there is there standardization across so many schools across diverse India, removing possibilities of experimentation in schools? In some ways, this question is obviously important for you because um, the Woodstock School is a law unto itself and uh, working in India. So how does that possibility to be part of a larger educational ecosystem uh, will is being enabled 
by the diversity of education boards. Yeah, I, I think that's a challenge. Uh, again, the constraints that we all we all operate under, no matter if you're independent or under a board. Um, how, how do you localize? To me, that's the big question. How do you localize what it is you're trying to teach? And so you might have an international curriculum at an international board or a, a local or a national one. It's like, how do, you, how, how do you make it real for the students that are right there? And I think what, one of the ways is, again, and the outward look. I think schools, ha, uh, it's incumbent upon schools to look outside of themselves. It's so easy to be focused on just you know, managing the day-to-day. -day. We've had schools reach out to us, uh, say one that was in transition. And I was a little bit reticent to uh, lean on the teachers to provide assistance uh, and this was related to shifting to online learning but uh, I was really pleased our all of our teachers stepped up all of our department heads stepped up with accessibility uh, to this other school in terms of here's what we're doing and here's our approach and laid it out and so um, that's one way by reaching out to outside of ourselves is one way in a sense to combat, I feel like the uh, standardization, again, back to the rationalization, normalizing of all systems into one. And uh, I, think, I think as we reach out across boundaries, across sections that we'll find that we, uh, we learn ourselves in the process, exchanging ideas. And also it, again, like I said earlier, it brings some of the magic back away from just uh, meeting standards all the time. Thank you very much, Dr. Cook. Ms. Mishra, there's a very interesting question. A lot of our viewers happen to be teachers and even uh, principals and counselors across the country. And this is from Sonali Majumdar, who's asking, um, when are we going to change the assessment system? And how can I, as a teacher, involve the parents in this process at the same time ensuring that the regulatory compliances relating to assessment and the institutional policies are adhered to? I have to say that uh, that is actually the, uh, the real pitfall of our education system. It has uh, all kinds of ideas about how to step up our education uh, pedagogy, how to improve our learning methods, we can go into all kinds of theories of uh, the MI, the uh, fixed and growth mindset, and you name it and we are doing it. But where we come back down to our knees is the assessment system. Because we are teaching to the test, that is where we fail. And in a country like ours, with a population like ours, it is really impossible for policymakers to make one standardized test. However, I do not want to sound cynical or pessimistic. I feel that if we can get through a situation where we teach our children to create something of value, which can either be a standalone value, which they can be tested on, for instance, making a, a, a boiler which, is, which uses less fuel and test them on it, let uh, government agencies come and say that, okay, this is almost good for patenting. That could be a, a way of testing. Another way could be that somebody else in a senior class starts something and a junior class continues it. So that is a collaboration and it is something that they are giving back to society. For example, creating a forest or uh, paving a road uh, making a bike path. So things which are of value, things which make a difference to our lives and to the lives of those around us. And if those can be validated by the community, by the people around us, but at the same time, I'm mindful of the fact that it will ultimately come down to our own integrity. It will be dependent entirely upon the integrity of the teachers, the integrity of the school to give those kind of objects to the community, which will actually have been created by the students. It would be so easy for the rivalry in the school to come to the fore 
and have things created by other people and name it as having been done by children. So before we say anything further, before we point fingers at the government or at an assessment system, which obviously is failing us somewhere, let us look within us, let us look at the reality of our country and pause for a moment. And then why can't we beat the system by teaching our children the experiential method, by letting them become creative. And if they are creative, they will be problem solvers. And then they will solve the problem of cracking an exam. Yet they would have ignited minds. That is my take on it. Well, thank you very much, um, Ms. Mishra, for that. Uh, Ms. George, there's a very interesting question about uh, from Santosh Mishra. This is regarding post-pandemic will collaboration become more natural than before? And given the fact that we use uh, a lot of IT uh, you know, you know, tools in our education system, uh, would this become quite natural? And how can uh, this element of collaboration that has been induced due to the pandemic uh, can actually foster greater collaboration even between schools and to what extent uh, institutional leaders, including principals and teachers, can contribute to the evolution of that collaboration. Uh, thank you for the question, um, uh, Santosh, and thank you, uh, Mr. Rajkumar. So, um, uh, yes, I mean, um, uh, if you're talking about, um, you know, uh, collaboration uh, post-pandemic, we have somewhere, these tools have always existed. There's just a little bit of uh, complacency in adopting these tools. So when you talk about platforms like Google or Microsoft Teams, they've always been there and there's always, they have always offered you this anytime, anywhere sharing option and collaborating. Uh, but we have kind of, uh, and there was also, uh, you know, um, uh, the required skill set training, uh, which was lacking. What has happened currently, what pandemic has done is it has made this possible within three months. So if I look at my own institution, where we are today in terms of the use of technology, in the last three to four months, five months, we have traveled a journey which would have probably taken us a year or two years or three years. So definitely all of us have, there's a change. I can see a shift in the mindset. I keep saying that the most important thing uh, to bring about any change is shifting uh, the mindset of people. And today, if I look at teachers across, uh, there's a definite shift because it, there was always uh, that you need to be physically there. You need to, um, uh, you know, physically do things and physically be present. You need to teach. Today, we are understanding that it's not just, of course, physical blended learning is becoming, I mean, it's going to be way more easy to implement blended learning once we're back into the school setup. Uh, so uh, definitely there's a shift in the mindset. People are also realizing the benefit of, uh, you know, collaboration because they were forced to do so. So, um, for example, I remember, you know, when we used to talk about and uh, we used to insist, we used to, I used to particularly say that, uh, you know, why not uh, have projects where the children are collaborating together, present, preparing the whole uh, concept, but it never happened online because we were always, uh, you know, we uh, have particular time structure, schedule structure, but, uh, the children have transportation facilities, so they have to kind of leave the school at a particular time. Today, we... They have explored the possibility of connecting online. Uh, the kind of resources that today we have exposed ourselves to. So I have speakers, I have guest speakers who are coming from different parts of the country today and talking to my class, which was always there, which, which always existed, but we never leveraged it. So today, have, having seen that, teachers are seeing the merit in connecting with each other. Uh, so I don't, I see this as, a, I mean, it's, it's going to be actually a big revolution in the way uh, we are uh, teaching learning in the future. So definitely uh, the only, um, you know, uh, uh, an exercise which I think every school should do after we go back or we are on campus is what worked when we were offline, uh, what worked when we are online and what were the benefits and how do we ensure that we maintain those benefits. So if we as an institution sit together and put down what are the key uh, things that can be done to continue that, uh, we'll uh, definitely, I mean, you know, that uh, we'll be 
a big uh, kind of a plus in ensuring that we con continue to leverage the collaboration that we are experiencing now. Thank you very much for that. Dilip, there's a very interesting um, question that has come, particularly with regard to our previous discussion. Raza Kasim is asking, how do we encourage constructive collaboration among educators between schools and higher education institutions? Now, of course, I, would, I could answer this question, but I thought as somebody, as a magazine that has uh, quite uh, you know, persuasively focused uh, this type of engagement and also attempted to build those bridges. Uh, what do you think that schools and universities could together do when it comes to promoting active collaborations? Yeah, it's a very good question. And we always believe that there should be a better connect between schools. And I think earlier, um, uh, several speakers raised it. So your expectations in your university uh, are, uh, I mean, most universities, not your university, uh, go according to the marks and the examination system, where everybody says, says let's change the examination system. And now, as uh, Ms. Mishra pointed out, this is not going to happen unless uh, the universities also begin to look beyond marks and look at the person who, who's making an application for admission. And I'm a great believer that uh, if you see in our education world uh, rankings, which is the world, by the way, the world's largest school rankings, we give equal importance to schools which uh, which provide co-curricular education, which provide uh, sports education, uh, and academic uh, education, academic learning is not the be-all and the end-all of uh, education. Education is a much wider, uh, wider subject than it's uh, perceived to be uh, in, uh, in India, the majority of India schools. So therefore, uh, I think uh, there has to be greater collaboration between universities and schools in that you need to tell the schools, the universities need to tell the schools, yes, we're not going to look only at marks. These are the other important things that we're going to look at. Debating skills, leadership skills, some demonstration of community work, out stuff done outside the schools. And they should be given some weightage. These activities should be given some weightage when you're, when you're deciding who to admit into uh, universities. And uh, that's why... If you have a closer collaboration between schools and universities, I think this will work. It's in the national interest because you get well-rounded people coming out of education institutions. Well, excellent. We are, of course, come to the end of this program. One last question to all of you, for all those viewers of this program, including teachers and principals and counselors and also some students, what would you like to tell them as they grapple the beginning of the new academic year through online with a high degree of uncertainty about the future as well. What would you like to tell them? Let me begin with Ms. Merotra, short reflections. Unmute yourself, Ms. Merotra. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think the shortest and the sweetest message is that life itself is so unpredictable. And you know that, and and I think uh, we are fortunate enough that we have witnessed a kind of a pandemic that in in a century uh, someone gets to see. And I I think we have to be very very positive and optimistic about learning all the good that we can learn from this challenge that has been thrown to us, which had been so unprecedented. No one of us were prepared for that. So I think we should be optimistic. We should be very positive. Uh, yes, of course, we should be aware of the challenges around us. We should be aware of that, how much more we need to do. But every day, step by step, uh, we should move towards uh, our, you know, uh, dreams and our goals. And we should be very clear that whatever challenges may come our way, uh, we are going, if we have a right attitude, right intent, uh, then I think nothing is impossible. So that's what, in this uncertainty times, we should hold on to. Thank you very much, Ms. Barotra. Dr. Cook? Yeah, um, I would simply say to everyone, reach beyond yourselves, uh, especially in this time of crisis, of whom much is given, much is expected. And this is a great opportunity to extend ourselves beyond our own communities, beyond your own classroom, and to other, other uh, sectors of society on a macro scale. So I, I think uh, reaching beyond ourselves 
is what I'd want to say. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cook. Uh, Ms. Mishra. So I would like to say that uh, I'm sure the children are laughing right now that all the technology and all the devices that we prevented you from using and protected you from are now the medium of communication between you and us. And like my students know that I have always told them that I'd like to give the world to you before I give the you to the world. So the world is right now available to you at the click of a mouse or at the flick of a button. Use it wisely and make something out of this opportunity that you will be able to proudly remember for the generations to come. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Mishra, Ms. George. Every, um, you know, every generation has to face some challenge and uh, a challenge which changes uh, the world as we understand or know of it. Uh, and currently it is this challenge. Uh, I think it's in our hands how we respond to it with grace, with, uh, uh, you know, gratitude every day. Thank for smaller things that you have, cherish small things that you have. Uh, this has brought us while we physically distanced ourselves, but I think we've socially connected uh, to each other. We started valuing love and connection uh, with each other. So stay connected, stay happy, take every day as it comes. Tomorrow is another day. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ms. George. Dilip, as always, you have the last word. Every great challenge requires a creative response. So this is a great challenge. Uh, time that we had an opportunity to convert a, a threat into an opportunity. And uh, this we can do by collaborating with each other and, and remembering that old adage in unity that is strength. Let's work. I, I call upon everybody, especially young people here, collaborate, learn to solve the problems and become richer for it. And it will stand us in good stead as we go along in the future. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to express my deep appreciation to my absolutely fantastic set of educators to join me in this Eminent Educators Colloquium. Uh, I truly enjoyed the conversation. I am grateful to the work that you're doing as inspiring leaders who are contributing to the transformation of young minds who will end up becoming the future leaders of our own societies. Keep up the good work that you're doing and I look forward to uh, seeing you in person. I also want to take this opportunity to thank my collaborator and partner, Dilip Thakur uh, of Education World. This is a public interest initiative of OP Jindal Global University and Education World. And every uh, fortnight we do this program. I look forward to seeing many of you on 9th October when we will have the next Eminent Educators Colloquium on the theme, The Future of Education, focusing on diversity and social justice. I will be joined by Ms. Monisha Datta, Principal of the Dune Girls School, Dera Dune, Dr. Nirpan Kumar Datta, Principal Miles Bronson Residential School, Gauhati, uh, hopefully Mr. Prabhat Jain, Director of Pathways World School, Gurgaon, Ms. Sheila Raghu, Principal, the Sanskar Valley School, Bhopal, and of course, my good friend, Dilip Thakur of Education World. Uh, I look forward to seeing all of you and thank you very much and uh, be safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All.